A piano keyboard looks pretty horrifying. 88 keys, that's a bunch. But it's not as bad as it looks. A computer keyboard has far more keys and all of them are different. A, a piano keyboard has only 12 keys that are genuinely different. You've already watched part one and taken and passed the first test, recognizing a perfect octave. If you passed, it means that you are not tone deaf. So let's take a close look at what makes a piano keyboard what it is. On the top of this first diagram is roughly half of a real piano keyboard. There's four octaves. One, two, three, four. This diagram identifies the name of every white key. Start here with, it's an easy one, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. If it wasn't for the black keys, there would be no pattern to the white keys at all. So if you imagine these not being here, you just have nothing but white keys. Thanks to the black keys, there is a basic pattern to all of the keys on the piano. And it's the black keys that create that pattern. There is always a white key on each side of every black key, and you'll learn why later. But take this black key, there's a white key on each side of it. Same for this one, same for these. There are two pairs of white keys with no black key between them. The EF and the BC. The lowest key on this top diagram is called C. On a real piano, the very lowest key is A, but that's not important. Going to the right, as the notes get higher, you will see two black keys in a row that we'll call a pair. Next are two consecutive white keys with no black key in between. And then three black keys in a row that we'll call a trio. That's the pattern of the black keys on the entire keyboard. A pair, a trio, a pair, a trio. After that first trio, you continue to the right and there are two more consecutive white keys with no black key in between. The second of those two white keys is followed by another pair of black keys. Just like the lowest C, there was a pair of black keys right above it. And it has the same name, C, as the first one. It also sounds exactly the same, except it is an octave higher in pitch. Every key called C, and there are eight of them on a piano, looks the same on the keyboard and sounds the same except for the higher pitch. Now the pattern of the black keys becomes obvious, just like the lowest C. This new C is followed by a pair of black keys, then a trio of the black keys, and right before the next pair of black keys is the next C. This pattern covers the entire piano. Let's take the note called F, which is this one. It's the first white key below a trio of black keys. Now look at the next F, which is here, and there it is again. It's the first white key below a trio of black keys. It's identical to the first one. Every white and every black key that is in exactly the same position relative to the pattern of black keys has exactly the same name and the same sound except in a higher and higher pitch as you go up octave by octave. For good reason that you will soon understand, I don't want to name the black keys just yet. The entire piano keyboard just amounts to a pattern of seven white keys, A through G, and five black keys that keep repeating over and over and over. Why is that? It's because musical tones repeat themselves and sound alike in what are called octaves. The first test that you took, that you must have passed or you wouldn't be here, tested your ability to recognize the sound of a true octave. Let's start with one of the keys called A. And we'll start with this one. 
look at the next six white keys. B, C, D, E, F, G. That's how every white key on the piano is identified. A through G, the first seven letters of the alphabet. That's pretty simple. And those seven letters identify every white key on a piano. You will defer, learn to find them very quickly just by using the black keys as signposts. Keys with the same alphabetical names, since they are true octaves, simply go together perfectly except for the difference in pitch. It works with every key on the piano. On both of these keyboards, the letter that identifies each white key is written on every white key. So you see them up here, and then they're also down here. Below this upper keyboard is something that is very, very important that you will also learn. And that's what we call the notes. Those are musical notes on the staff. We'll call them symbols, just like the three colored lights on a traffic light. Red, yellow, and green. Each color tells you to do something. Red is stop, yellow is be cautious, and green is go. The symbols shown on this diagram are the symbols that you see on sheet music, and they are just symbols telling you what key you should hit on the piano. If you'll look here, there's a key on the piano above these notes, and every one of them is identified by the note. I will always use the word note when I am talking about these paper symbols, and the word key when I am talking about the keys on your piano or the keys on this paper keyboard. Every note is located on what is called a staff. This is a staff. There are always five regular lines on a staff. One, two, three, four, five. And one or two little extra lines at the bottom and the top. This is a little extra one, and this one is, that one is, this is, and that is. And that's for the very lowest notes and the very highest notes that you need to read. You'll learn about them in a few minutes. Between the lines are four spaces. One, two, three, four and a few extra ones that are created by the little extra lines, like this little extra line creates this space, this extra line creates that space, and the same at the top. Every note on sheet music will be on one of those lines or in one of those spaces, and every note will be referring to a white key on the piano. Notes with sharps or flats next to them are only for the black keys. They're, they will look just like this, but there will be a symbol next to them. I'll explain how you name sharps and flats in a few minutes. So including the, uh, the little extra ones on this staff, there are 17 lines and spaces on sheet music that identify 17 white keys. This bottom one is the note for... A, the A key, which is right above it. And the top note is the third of three C notes. Here's C. That's middle C. I'll explain later. This is the next highest C, and then the very highest is way up there. At the far left end of this staff is a funny-looking curlicue. That's this thing. <laughs> that identifies this staff as the treble clef. And that's piano teacher talk, or what I call the right-hand staff in plain old English. All traditional piano music has two staffs. The right-hand staff is on top, and for traditional music readers is only for the right hand. And that's all you're ever going to see, really. Beneath it is a totally separate staff called the bass clef. It's a little smaller. It should be the same size, but it didn't get to that point. Here's a small version of a bass clef. The symbol for the bass clef is this funny-looking backward C, or giant comma, just so you know. Uh, 
if this was regular piano music, it would be the same size as this staff, and there'd be a line like this that connects the two staffs together. You don't need to remember this symbol because you will never see it again in this program. If you ever see it on sheet music, ignore it. The terrible problem of reading traditional piano music is that the notes on the lines and spaces of the bass clef, that's this one down here, identify different keys on your piano keyboard. They're not the same as these, like A, B, C. They're just not the same. It would be like having one half of all traffic lights like this. Green means stop, yellow means go, and red means be cautious. The notes that identify keys on the bass clef are like that. They are on totally different lines and spaces than the same notes that identify keys on the right hand staff. That difference alone is the reason that millions of people have given up learning to read piano music and have forever given up playing the piano. I promised you that I would simplify the entire process of playing by ear and this is a huge example of that simplification. You will never, ever have to learn the bass clef. You don't need it. From now on, this is just the staff, because it's always going to be the right-hand staff. Sometimes I may call it the treble clef. The most important key on a piano is called middle C. I put it here. And I line this one up with it, and this is middle C on this diagram, on both of them. Because you are beginners, you are barely in the first grade in this old-fashioned one-room schoolhouse. Here is your first project, and you should listen very carefully. On your piano, middle C is the first white key below the pair of black keys that are closest to the middle of your entire keyboard. It'll be slightly to the left of the middle of your keyboard. Now, go to your piano and mark the big end, that's this end, of that white key with a piece of colored tape, like red masking tape. Now, look directly below the middle C key at the note on the staff. And that's this one. And it's the similar note for middle C on sheet music is located on the little extra line below the bottom line of the staff. There's the bottom line of the staff, there's the little extra one. When you see that symbol, that exact paper note, you will always hit the middle C key on your piano, the one you just marked. Now you know exactly what the symbol for middle C looks like on sheet music. It looks like that and exactly where to find it on your keyboard. It's the one with the tape. <laughs> this bottom diagram has the advantage of giving you the exact names of both the white keys and black keys for three C octaves. This is a C octave, one, two, three. So as not to disorient you, you, I have marked this one in the same way as middle C. You already should recognize the pattern of the black keys, a pair, a trio, a pair, a trio. Based on the pattern of the black keys, you should also be able to recognize all seven of the white keys and their names. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and where they are in relation to the black keys. Unfortunately, we have now hit the worst stumbling block of reading music. I will try to explain it slowly and carefully. Rule number one, every black key has two possible names, and both names start with the name of either the white key below it or the white key above it. A sharp is identified by the little tic-tac-toe symbols, and I don't know if you can see these, they're pretty small. And a flat is identified by a little lowercase b, that's this guy, with a pointy bottom. Now, to make 
life a little easier for you because of the size problem. Here is a big sharp symbol. This is what it looks like. Here's the staff, the five lines. And this is what it looks like there. Unless one or more sharps or flat symbols are at the very beginning of a staff, right after these double lines, those symbols will always be just to the left of any note on any line or in any space on a staff. Over here is a huge version of a flat symbol. Now you know what they look like. Remember, those lines and spaces identify white keys. Whether a single sharp or flat symbol is at the beginning of a staff or just to the left of a note on the staff, it will always be on the same line or in the same space as the white note that the sharp or flat symbol modifies. So this giant sharp symbol is in the space on the staff the bottom space that identifies the white F note. Because of the sharp symbol at the beginning of the staff, or to the left of the F note on the staff, that symbol tells you to hit the first black key called F sharp, which is above that white key. In the same way, this giant flat symbol is on the line on the staff for the white B note and tells you to hit the first black key called B flat below that white key. Now let me show you. On here, the F, that sharp symbol was on in the F space, the bottom space. Here's the F key, Here's the, here it is on paper note. And so, down here, where it said F sharp, you go up. And where it said B flat, you would go down. If the sheet music that you are reading is for a song that is written in a key that has one or more black keys, it will either have one or more sharp symbols or one or more flat symbols at the very beginning of every staff telling you which black keys you will always need to hit. Sheet music will almost never have both sharps and flats in the same song. Rule number two of sharps and flats, if it has one or more sharps, the name of every black key will be a sharp. And if it has one or more flats, the name of every black key will be a flat. Rule number three of sharps and flats. A sharp symbol tells you to go up from the named white key and hit the very next black key, F to F sharp. A flat symbol tells you to go down from the named white key to the very next black key, G, G flat. Here's a good, and that's the same note we just called F sharp. That's, I'm sorry, it's the same key. Here's a word trick to help you remember this rule. When you want to cause an object, like this diagram, to lay flat, you always just lay it down. Remember, flat is always down. Now look at the white key called middle C up here. Look below it to where it is shown on the sheet music. Here's the note for middle C. If the sheet music had a sharp next to it, you must hit the black key on the piano immediately above that middle C. That black key is then called C sharp. Here it is down here. Now look at the white key right next to the C and that's D and come down and there's where the note for the white key D is always located is in the space 
right below the bottom line of the staff. You must, and then there was a flat next to it, a little flat symbol. Then you must hit the black key on the piano immediately below the white D key. And that black key is now called D flat. It is the same black key that we just called C sharp. You can see this key has both names on it and each name refers to the correct white key that it modifies. Now look at the black keys on the, this bottom keyboard and you will see that each black key has two of the letters of the alphabet that are the same as the white keys that are below and above it and each has the little sharp and flat symbols. Here they are. The flat symbols are the top ones, the sharp symbols are the bottom ones. Now look again at the first black key at the bottom of this keyboard the D-flat and the C-sharp key. If you were playing a song in a key that had notes with sharp symbols, the symbol for this note on paper and the name of this black key on the keyboard would be C-sharp, because sharps go up from the named white key. All the other black keys would also be called sharps. If you were playing a song in, in a key that had flat symbols, the symbol for this note on paper and the name of this black key on the keyboard would be D-flat because flats go down from the named white key. All the other black keys would also be called flats. I'm sure that this sounds complicated, but you will get used to it. Here is the most, the most important diagram in this entire beginner section. Since I don't really understand computers, I had to draw it just for this program. If you can do it electronically, do it. If not, that means that you're going to have to draw it just like I did. It is essential. I will give you the exact dimensions because the keyboard on the bottom, that's all of this is a keyboard, has to be exactly to scale, the same size as your piano keys. And this was drawn perfectly, or nearly perfectly to scale. And the staff on top has to be able to match the notes to these keys. You may need to watch this several times and pause your computer on this diagram as often as necessary to get this right. Because we are in a one-room schoolhouse, this entire program is based on you teaching yourself to read very simple music. To do that, you must teach yourself to play at least six scales on the piano. And to do that, you must teach yourself how to read the notes on the staff. If you are a beginner and decide that you don't want to go to the trouble of creating your own version of this diagram, you should simply quit this program and give up the idea of playing the piano by ear. If you're still committed to playing by ear, here's how you will do it. When it's finished, we will call your version your letter A diagram. That was the letter I used. I put it up there. You draw it, and I'll give you the dimensions. It's a legal sized sheet of paper laying lengthwise. It'll use the whole sheet. Wait to draw it until after you see the next diagram with the dimensions. You'll need a ruler and a T-square to be accurate. You will draw it just like this with an exact keyboard at the bottom and just a blank staff at the top. Don't bother to do, deal with notes at this point. The, the staff at the top will have five lines and four spaces just like this and all the others you'll see. You blacken all of the black keys like this, leaving white boxes. 
You can go ahead and add the sharps and flats, assuming you can read them uh, on the, what you're looking at. And be sure to add the little sharp and flat symbols to each one of them. On the white keys, add all the names of those white keys at the bottom. And on this diagram, this is middle C. That's the one with the tape on your piano. When you draw the notes on the staff, that's up here, above the white keys, they should be as white, they should be white and as large as possible. This is G on the keyboard. This is the G note on the staff, and it's big and it's white. This is A, that's where it is on the staff. This is B, C, D, E, E, F, so on and so forth. So all of those notes for white keys are white notes, just to make things a little easier for you. The notes above the black keys will have to be smaller due to the space available. Solid black and must include the sharp and flat symbols above the little black notes, and that's the only place there's room for it is above them, and that's because of the space. And here's how you draw them. Let's take this right here. Well, let's do a middle C. Middle C key on this paper keyboard. Look at the first black key above it, the one that says C sharp and D flat in the white boxes. Since it has two names on the keyboard, you have to show it two times on the staff. And here's why there's two little black notes above this black key. So you draw the two little black notes. The first little black note is on the little line for middle C. It's on the same line as this white key and this white note. This little black note is on that same line and there's a little sharp symbol above it which means that on the keyboard you go up from the named white key, the C, to the C sharp. The second little black note is not on that line, it's on in the space where the D key is. Here's the D white key. That's where the D always goes. This, is, this little black note is on in that same space and there's a little flat above it. So you draw the second little black note in that space with a flat symbol above it, which means that on the keyboard you go down from the white D to the black D flat. Because you have to draw your letter A diagram, here is a blown up version that I just mentioned earlier. I think I'll push this out of the road for the moment. And this is not to scale, and it only shows five white keys, C, D, E, F, and G, and three black keys. This is a pair. That's a trio, but I didn't go any further than that. Here are the five lines of the staff. One, two, three, four, five. Here is middle C, and you can tell that that it's middle C because that white note is on the line, the little line that's below, the first one, below the bottom of the staff. On the far right are the names of all of the white keys on the staff. So if you look at this middle C, which is always the first little line below the bottom of the staff, that's middle C, come over here, there's the little line again, and that's the C note. In this space is the D. Here it is here. E on the bottom line. F in the bottom space. G on the next line up. Then A, B, C in that space again. That's the octave. Then D on that line. E in the top space and F on the top line.
And here is what the white notes look like on what you're going to draw. It's the big white round one above the C, then the one above the D, the E, the F, and the G. And each of those white keys will be white notes. The black keys will each have two smaller black oval notes on the staff. Those two black notes refer to this single key. The two names of each of these black keys are on each of those keys, C sharp and D flat. So you look up here, there's the note on the line for C, there's the sharp, C sharp, and there's the name. You do the same with the D. There's the D, and that's on the space right below the bottom line of the staff, always. So that black note is D with a flat next to it, and there's the D flat. That's true of the D sharp. Here's the D, D sharp, and the E, E flat, E flat. Remember, for a sharp, you go up from the named white key to the first black key. That'd be D to D sharp. For a flat, you go down from the named black key, white key, I'm sorry. There's the E, there's the E flat. That's how you name them, and that is how you draw the actual notes. So here's the D, the D sharp, and there's the D and the D sharp. Here's the E and the E flat. Here's the E note and the E flat. And what makes it tricky is that one key has two names, and that's true of all the black keys. I know this is confusing because you are a beginner, but you will get used to it once you have learned the scales that you need to learn. It is very important that you accurately put these notes on your letter A diagram. If you are unsure, then before you try to fill it in, ask a friend who reads music to look at your blank staff and help you fill in all of those notes. If they are confused about what you want them to do, have them watch these last few minutes to understand exactly what needs to be on your letter A diagram. Now here's your letter A diagram again. And here is the, are the dimensions. Now, this is drawn to scale also. The only difference is this is just a keyboard. This is a, the staff that's on your letter A diagram is not on this. The white keys at both ends may be a little narrow. This one and this one, especially this one. <laughs> Your letter A diagram must be drawn to scale, which means the same size as your piano keys. Here are the exact dimensions of each key. The entire keyboard and every white key is 6 inches or 152 millimeters from front to back. The black keys are 4 and an eighth inches or 104 millimeters from front to back. The black keys are five eighths of an inch wide or 15 millimeters. The white keys are seven eighths of an inch 
on the front were 22 millimeters wide and 7 sixteenths of an inch or 12 millimeters on the back. The space between all of the white keys on the front and between the B and C keys and the E and F keys on the back as well, see these are all the same, is one sixteenth of an inch or two millimeters. And those are all your dimensions. On your staff, on your diagram A, the space between each of these lines is one quarter of an inch or six millimeters. And this is what you should end up with. The keyboard drawn to scale at the bottom with all of the white keys and black keys properly labeled. On the, sta sta on the top, the staff with all of the correct notes directly above the correct keys. Since it has to be rigid, cut out two pieces of cardboard like I have done here. The same size as the diagram itself. There's a reason for the second one. You can permanently attach your letter A diagram to the one piece of cardboard with scotch tape or you can use thumbtacks. I use paper clips because I want to separate them when I'm finished. Since it is drawn to scale and is identical to your piano keyboard, you will put this on your music rack on, the, on your piano directly above the keyboard on your piano and you will line up this middle C with middle C on your piano, which is the one you put tape on. So on your piano, it would stand up and lean against the music rack like this. And your middle C on your piano would be directly below this middle C. So I'm not going to take a break. You can take a break and go ahead and draw your diagram using the dimensions I just gave you and everything shown on this diagram. When you're finished, come back to this part 1.1. .1. When you play a simple octave, you are hitting two specific notes that are in the exact same position on the keyboard in relation to all the other keys. Wherever you start, count the first one and every white and black key going up the keyboard until you hit the number 12. Let's start with middle C. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The very next key will be the same key as your first key. It's C, just like this C. Except for the pitch, every octave sounds the same. If the first and last key is a C key, as I just showed you, it is called a C octave. So ignoring the differences in pitch, there are just 12 different sounding notes in music, every octave having the same sound and name. Here is an F octave, goes from here to here. And you would hit 12 and the 13th note would be the second F. So that means that there are just 12 different names for all of those octaves. Every white key shown on your letter A diagram has its own octave, and every white key has its own eight-note scale. You play the bottom key of the, first oct of the octave first, then six more keys, then the top note of the octave, and then you go back down when you're playing a scale. Every black key has its own octave, but only the ones called flats have scales. There are no scales that are called sharps. There's no sense in duplicate, duplicating it. So the B flat scale starts here on B flat, and it would go B flat, C, D, E flat, F, G, A, B flat. 
And while there is an A sharp octave, same, those are the same notes, there's no such thing as an A sharp scale. It's, it's just called B flat. You have finished your letter A diagram and that was your first major project. Your last major product is a, project is a lot easier, but it is just as important. You need to draw the first six of the twelve major scales. That means that if you don't want to go to the trouble, you should just quit the entire program immediately and give up playing the piano by ear. You will have to draw them just as I show you. From now on, we'll call them scale diagrams 1 through 6. Later, you will identify them by the letter that represents each scale, like C, E flat, G, and so on. Truthfully, this is the last step in making it possible for you to teach yourself the major scales. If I was a piano teacher, I would be sitting next to you every week for many months, showing you exactly how to play these scales and making you practice them. But our one-room schoolhouse doesn't allow for that. When you have finished the first six scale diagrams, you will use each one of them one at a time, along with your letter A diagram, to teach yourself exactly how to play all six of those scales using both hands. You will slowly and certainly learn, first, to read every note on the treble clef. You'll learn the name of every note on the staff. The keys that you need to hit on your piano to respond to each of these notes. The name of every key on your piano the fingers and thumbs that you must use to properly play every note of every scale. And they are quite different, some of them. You will automatically, as you learn the scales, be creating the dexterity that you must have to play the piano. That means your fingers will be able to work, find keys, and hit them. And last and most importantly, as you learn these scales, you will automatically learn the sound of every major scale. And recognizing sounds is the heart and soul of playing by ear. That adds up to seven per perfect reasons to keep going. Each scale diagram will be thumbtacked near the top of the second piece of cardboard and placed on the music rack of your piano one at a time, exactly like this. This is on your piano. This will go next to it. And each scale diagram, you'll put it so that it's in fairly perfect, this isn't quite big enough, but it's close enough for government work. I've started with this scale diagram number one, but it's important that you put each of the scale diagrams, as you learn each scale, one at a time, on this piece of cardboard so that this is now standing right next to this, and it's one big long piece on your, on your piano music rack. I've started with scale diagram number one, which is uh, the C scale, because it has no sharps or flats, which makes it easier. Unfortunately, I have a regrettable but unavoidable problem. When you start learning this C scale and every other scale, you be, need to be able to see both ends of these diagrams on your music rack with the two staffs lined up just like this. But for you to be, see both ends now, I would have to move the camera further away and that would make everything too small. To draw these scale diagrams, you need to be able to see them clearly on this screen. So this is how you actually use them. is exactly like this on your piano. And my only solution is I made up an extra one of these. This is the same C, C scale. So I'm going to slide this over some like this. 
and this is not how you will see it. on your piano with this thing up here. This is not where it belongs, but at least you can see everything that I'm showing you now. This will always, and meaning this, will always be to the left just like this. So, that this part 1.1 is roughly the same length as part 1.2. This is as close as any to end this 1.1, good a place as any. Your next task is to go to part 1.2. And so this is the end of 1.1, and I thank you for making it this far. And this is the end of 1.1.